and start the presentation. So thank you for joining this class. It's titled All About Ticks. Uh, my name is Ashley Bodkins and I work with the University of Maryland Extension Office in uh, Garrett County, so the westernmost county in Maryland. And I have my colleague Sherry Frick with me today. Do you want to give a quick hello? Hey everybody, this is Sherry Frick from University of Maryland Extension. I work in Allegheny County. I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Educator there and also the Master Gardener Coordinator. And I just love work working with my friend Ashley and looking forward to today's presentation. Thank you, Sherry. Yes, and as Sherry said, so I do the Master Gardener program in uh, Garrett County and also answer any of the home horticulture questions. So that's a little bit about us. And as Master Gardener coordinators, uh, we do get some questions about ticks um, as part of our um, assignment with extension and we do get to identify a lot of critters and bugs and insects. So that's why we decided we would like to uh, put this presentation together for you all and it is adapted from uh, Emily Zobel's presentation called Bugs That Bite. So just in case anybody's already seen that one, um, you might want to check it out. She does a great job with that presentation too. So let's get started. So the first slide that we always like to start every presentation with is uh, this flowchart that tells everyone about our connection to the University of, of Maryland. Even though our name does state University of Maryland Extension, we like to reiterate that uh, we are part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And this just kind of helps everyone to understand that even if you aren't from Maryland, every state in the United States does have a land grant university system. Uh, so you can always access the extension through them directly. Uh, and most counties actually have a, a local office. That's the case here in Maryland. We have every county in Baltimore City that has an extension service that you can access um, to ask questions and, and that sort of thing. One more slide just to uh, give folks some other information. Uh, we do work closely with the Home and Garden Information Center and the Maryland Master Gardener Program. Uh, and a couple years ago, the Master Gardener Program kind of identified these six different areas of interest. So we have specific classes in almost every one of these areas. So if you're interested in a specific topic, uh, you can check out the website um, to get more information. All right, so I'm going to leave my video off just to make sure that we don't have any internet connection issues. As I said before, uh, please feel free uh, to type information into the chat if you have questions as we go along or we can wait till the end uh, to try to address the questions. But the plan for today is that we want to talk about tick biology. How to identify ticks, that's a good question that we get a lot. Is, is this bucket tick or is it not? Uh, we're going to talk about how to prevent tick bites and um, having them, you know, on you and your pets. We'll talk a little bit about Lyme disease. And then lastly, we'll um, address the new exotic invasive tick that we're seeing. It's the Asian longhorn tick. You can also use the, um, the guides up there if you have on us to go faster or go slower. Uh, there are buttons that you can help give us some feedback if you are having, um, you know, anything you want to tell us. Uh, it's at the bottom of the participant box if you have that open on your screen. So why is it that you guys decided to join this class? Uh, I have a feeling that it's probably because ticks are a very common vector of diseases uh, for humans. They're one of the reasons that people are really concerned about them is because they can make us sick. So, you know, while other things like maybe those little tiny black ants that get in your house are a nuisance, uh, ticks can be a real problem because they can make us sick. Uh, so I think the more we know about ticks, the more information we can share with friends and family and the safer that we can be. Uh, so that's, I think, one of the reasons that most people are interested in this topic, even though <laughs> Uh, you know, bugs in general tend to kind of give people the heebie-jeebies sometimes, uh, and ticks are no, um, you know, no exception there. They can definitely be a little bit yucky to think about or talk about. But definitely the one disease we're going to spend a lot of time on today is talking about Lyme disease. 
So a little bit about biology of a tick. What makes them different from other critters? Uh, they're actually an arachnid, so they're more closely related to spiders and mites than they are to other insects like ants and butterflies and that sort of thing. Uh, lots of different organisms get confused with ticks. Um, the one thing you want to think about is that they're really small. Uh, when they're in their larval stage, they only have six legs, but the rest of their life cycle, they're going to have eight. So that's one distinguishing characteristic that we tell people to look at. Uh, unfortunately, when they're in that larval stage, the very smallest uh, stage, if you look at this picture uh, that we have displayed here, uh, the one all the way on the left is the very first size that they that they pop out of the egg at and they're so small that um, a lot of times you can barely even see them um, that's what makes them so hard uh, so hard to see a lot of people say that if you're familiar with typing if you were to type in the size 12 font and type a period that's about the size of a larval tick so pretty small uh, then as we move up along, the adults are only about the size of a poppy seed, and that would be when they're not engorged. Um, so it's still pretty darn small, and that's the, that's the scary thing about it is you can kind of overlook them um, because they're just, they're just not, not really large. We have six species in Maryland that we're going to talk specifically about each of those species a little bit later on in the presentation. So what is the life cycle? I found this to be very interesting. I hope you will too. Um, just like other critters, they start out as an egg. Uh, the adult female is gonna lay the egg. Uh, from the egg, they go to a nymph. Again, the nymph has eight legs. Uh, then it goes to an adult. And in order to go from one life cycle to the next, these ticks have to have a blood meal. That's kind of the, the determining factor at how long it takes uh, for this life cycle to be completed. So it can go anywhere from, you know, two years to three years. Uh, some of these different types of ticks can actually go uh, up to 200 days without even eating. So that is just amazing to me. I like to eat multiple times a day, so I don't know how they can go for that long of a period and still survive, but that's what makes um, controlling them and preventing them so very important. Um, so you can see the picture here. Um, again, I did type the little black dots out from uh, the size of a 12 point period, it says. That would be the 12 point font that you can see there on your screen. Those row of seven um, periods, that would be the size of a larval, uh, a larval stage of the tick. So again, six legs goes into the nymph after a blood meal of each of these stars indicates where they're going to be feeding on um, some sort of a mammal with warm blood. Uh, we go to the eight-legged eight nymph, again another blood meal. Uh, we go into the adult tick, another blood meal, and that's when they're going to be able to be to actually lay the eggs. Um, a lot of these females can lay anywhere from a thousand to two thousand, maybe even three thousand eggs, um, which after that time uh, the female it does die. Uh, but that's a lot of eggs for one critter to be uh, to be putting out at one time. So that's the life cycle. Um, the other thing that kind of makes this hard to explain is that there's no real time frame that I can tell you that it's going to happen. It depends on how quickly they can find their next blood meal um, between how, uh, how quickly it's going to go from the egg to larva to nymph to adult. Um, so it's really going to be dependent on the time of year. Uh, you know, in the winter time, especially in our climate here in Western Maryland, there aren't a whole lot of warm-blooded mammals out and about, so their opportunity to get a, a blood meal is very much limited. Uh, so they have a much longer overwintering stage, which is going to, of course, extend the total life cycle length. The other uh, thing that we hear a lot of folks say is that I was walking by this tree and a tick jumped out or fell out of the tree. Uh, ticks do not have any wings, so they do not fly. Uh, they also don't have jumping legs. Uh, if you take a look at all eight of their legs, uh, they're not made for jumping. Uh, they're made for crawling. Uh, so a lot of times the only way that they find a host is what they call by a, a process called questing. Uh, so they actually will just sit and wait. Um, ticks are really good at sensing a couple things. They're really good at sensing carbon dioxide, heat, 
or movement. So sometimes whenever folks are doing research on ticks and trying to collect them for research, they'll actually use carbon dioxide traps. So folks will use carbon dioxide traps. I'm not sure if you guys heard all that. My internet kind of punched out for a second. Um, but they'll use carbon dioxide traps to catch the ticks out in the wild uh, to see how many are in a specific area. Um, otherwise, uh, they also can sense heat and they can also sense movement. So that's how they're going to find their host uh, that they're going to get their blood meal from. So as it gets wet, they tend to move down lower into the thickets. Uh, so when it's wet, they're going to be down low. When it's dry and warm, they're going to be up higher. Uh, and again, they're just very, um, very opportunistic. Uh, so they're just looking for anything that they can uh, latch onto to get something to eat. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was the tick feeding habits. Uh, so they can feed usually anywhere from three to five days. Uh, this slide says three to four, but I've gotten reports back from one of the resources that we're going to talk about, the tickencounter.org. Um, and they have said that this tick has been attached for like five days. Um, but the interesting thing to know about this is the longer they're attached, the more likely it is that you're, you could get a disease or you could get a pathogen from the, the tick. So the sooner you find it, that's why the sooner, you know, you should do the tick checks every single day because if you find it the day it attaches, your chances of getting a sort of a pathogen that could make you sick definitely uh, decreases. Uh, they always say that whenever a tick first hatches out of an egg, so when it's in that larval form, it does not have any pathogens to transmit to you. So a lot of times if you get bit by a larva, uh, which a lot of times we don't even know because they're so small and they have a hard time penetrating a, you know, human skin, um, they tend to feed more on uh, mammals like mice and birds and chipmunks and that sort of thing. Um, they have a hard time penetrating our skin. But a lot of times they don't, they've not been infected yet with any type of, of pathogen. Um, so you don't have to worry as much about getting sick from, from a larval form. This is a view of what we would traditionally think of as the head, uh, which isn't exactly like a head of, you know, what we would think of with a brain and a mouth and that sort of thing. It's basically all mouth on a tick. Uh, but you can see the hypostome, uh, which is the part that is very jagged on these ticks. Uh, every species is going to look a little bit different um, based on the different shape of the hypostome and the different barbs on there can kind of help folks um, identify uh, specific tick species. But what happens is those little um, kind of like fish hooks, they, you know, they go into your, into your body and it really helps to hold them there. That's why it's so difficult to pull them out. They also kind of have like this glue that happens, uh, so it's really, really hard to get them to release um, if you do get bit by them. Uh, you can see the chelicerary, which would be the chelicera, which would be kind of like the jaws or the mandibles you would kind of think about, um, and then the palp as well. Here's a 3D microscope picture of one of the hypostomes. So you can see how jagged it is and why it would be so difficult uh, to actually remove that once it is um, embedded into your skin. Uh, so this is just a little bit more about the different um, diseases uh, that, that are caused from, from ticks. Again, most are not born carrying any type of diseases. So once they hatch out of the egg in that larva form, uh, they're not they're not going to have anything that can make you sick, but it's after they feed on a host uh, that's been infected or that is infected, that's whenever the the problem uh, starts to occur because then they have that living in their gut, and whenever they are feeding on you, they are pushing saliva into your body, which contains any number of these pathogens, and that's when when we are going to start to see human human sicknesses occurring. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Sherry to talk to us about tick identification. Okay, so Ashley, are you going to give me control there and I'll see if I can. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, 
So as you can see, uh, we're going to talk about tick identification. And on this slide, I wonder if anybody knows what that is. If you do, you can type it in the chat box. We'll see if anybody knows. But hopefully by the end of this presentation, if you don't know now, you will know. So I don't see any guesses. Ooh, very good. We got a brown dog, <laughs> nasty. Somebody says nasty. Uh, you're very close. This is an American dog tick, and it's actually a female. So we're going to talk about how we can figure that out. Okay. And it's not advancing for me. Let's see. Whoops. Not sure. Sorry about that, everyone. Handed me over the controls and there we go. I'm going to bring up the slide. Have we got it? Nope. Okay. Okay, so Ashley, are you controlling the screen for me? Okay. I can, yeah. Do you want me to do it here? Let's. Um... Yeah, I was trying, but my arrows weren't working again. So I'm not really sure what the problem is, but we will continue on. So that's okay. Here okay, we go. So, okay, so somebody in the chat said, How did I know it was a female? Well, uh, it, I know it's a female because of the size of the scutum. So if you take a look at this diagram of a tick, and um, you'll see, we already talked about the, the mouth parts. Ashley had a real nice picture of that and the different parts there. And then there's a plate behind the head that's called the scutum. Now in females, the scutum is smaller than in the males. Now with a male, the scutum might actually be almost as large as the entire body of the tick. Okay, now at the bottom margin of the tick, you'll see what's called festoons. It kind of looks like little um, divisions or plates. Okay, some ticks have these and some don't. So it's important, it's an important thing to look for when trying to identify these ticks. Uh, a lot of these things you're not necessarily going to be able to see with the naked eye. You're going to need a hand lens or a, a microscope. Usually by the time they're really visible, they've got a blood meal and they look pretty pretty big and they look actually look different than they do without a blood meal. But uh, I've had the uh, distinct pleasure of having to ID many different ticks. So I can tell you, you know, you need some magnification to see these details. Okay, Ashley, forward me, please. Okay, so we're gonna compare uh, four different types of scutum patterns in ticks. And you see here on the Left hand side, the first one is the black leg deer tick. And we look at that pattern. Now, these are all females, okay? And the scutum is going to be smaller and it's right behind the head. Next one is a lone star tick, we have brown dog tick, and the American dog tick. So, what I want you to notice here is with the uh, black legged tick, the scutum behind the female's head is just, it doesn't really have a particular pattern. It's very round and dark, okay? And if you now, if you look at the mouth parts, they're, they are elongated compared to the brown dog tick and the American dog tick, okay? Now we look at the lone star tick. And I think this one is probably one of the easier ones to identify because it has a very uh, characteristic uh, white, whitish yellowish spot on the back of the scutum there. And even after this tick has had a blood meal, you could still see that white spot on the scutum. Now, the Lone Star tick also has a longer uh, mouth part, okay? Now, when we look at the brown dog tick, there's really not a lot that um, you can, you know, look for patterns or anything. It is a brown, just a brown scutum, kind of indistinct. And, but if when you look at the head and the mouth parts, they are much uh, shorter and broader than those of the Lone Star tick and the Black Leg tick. Now, I think probably um, the American dog tick is also very easy to identify because the scutum has um, these various white markings and the mouth parts are also kind of shorter and broader. Okay, Ashley, let's move on to the next slide. 
So this is a great chart that you can find on tickencounter.org and it gives a lot of great information about how to identify ticks. And in this chart, you'll see on the left-hand side, we have the species with its, uh, you know, its common name and the species name. And then it tells you what uh, diseases it transmits. Then it shows you the sputum pattern for the female. And then they give you a chart that shows you the different stages of the tick, tells you when it's active and the habitat. So for the American dog tick, um, you'd see the diseases that it transmits there. And all of these pictures um, and under the sputum pattern, these are all the females. And the males do look a little bit different, okay? I'll, I'll talk about that when I get to the individual ticks. So when you look at the uh, different um, stages, you'll see that, um, well, you can see the difference between the male and the female here with the American dog ticks. So the first and the last two are the adult male and then the adult female. So you'll see with the um, adult male, it's got white markings kind of all over its back and it, the sputum is almost as big as its entire back. Um, it does have festoons. Okay, and the female, you can see the sputum is smaller and white markings. Okay, now we'll go to the black leg deer tick and you'll see with the adult male that it just basically looks dark. And then you have, and the sputum covers almost the entire body and then you'll see this lighter colored rim near the bottom, okay? And then the female of the black-legged tick, you know, it's got a nice round black sputum and then the rest of the body can look kind of reddish or reddish brown, okay? Now, when we look at the brown dog tick, you look at the male and the female adults, the male, um, it's just it just looks dark brown and it has like indentations over the over its back and the female doesn't look a whole lot different the sputum uh, is is smaller and you can see kind of the outline there is a little darker than the rest of the body but um, their shape is more oval I'd say all of the body shapes are more oval except for the lone star tick which tend their body shape tends to be more rounded so if we look at the lone star tick the male and the female the male has some white markings um, on the festoons near uh, the ridge or the, the bottom part of the sputum. And then the female has got that nice white spot on the, on the sputum, which makes it really easy to identify. And they also have festoons. Okay, the Gulf Coast tick we see is, is also got white markings on it, so you might um, you know, get it confused with an American dog tick. They look kind of similar, but uh, the Gulf Coast tick is not uh, very, very prevalent in Maryland. So that's one thing. But if you look closely, you can see there are, see what the differences are in those white patterns on their bodies. All right, Ashley, send me to the next slide. Okay, hold on, I'm having issues. Uh, yeah, sorry. No, you're okay, I was annotating. Can you guys see the marks that I did on there? Yeah, that's great, I like that. Okay, just wanted to make sure, sorry, I've never done that before. Here we go. Very good. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about these ticks individually. So the first one we have here is the, the Gulf Coast tick. And as I said, it's not very common in Maryland. Uh, the region where you're gonna find it mostly in Maryland is gonna be um, along the western coast of the Bay. And that's because it likes to be found in grass prairies and coastal uplands. Okay, so this tick is very similar in that it requires three different hosts in order to complete its life cycle. and it can actually this one can produce as many as 10,000 eggs in one clutch and the size of these ticks for the adults is anywhere from a quarter inch when it hasn't had a blood meal up to perhaps a half of an inch and they usually feed on uh, or the larvae feed on small animals like birds and rodents and rabbits uh, as adults, they tend to feed on larger animals, dogs, coyotes, bears, and panthers. They don't tend to, generally tend to, to go on humans. Okay, next one, please. 
the brown dog tick. So this one uh, can tr transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever, canine ehrlichiosis, canine babesiosis. They prefer to feed on dogs, but occasionally they will. Um, you tend to find them in their kennels and uh, wherever they're, they're living. So you can get infestations in your house, which can be very unpleasant. Um, an adult female tick can lay uh, up to 3,000 eggs. And so that's a lot of eggs. So, you know, if you get um, a pregnant female in your house, you could be in for a lot of trouble uh, dealing with them. But uh, like I said, they prefer to be on dogs rather you know, than humans. And uh, adults have been known to live for as long as 200 days without a, a blood meal. So an adult, when it hasn't had a blood meal, is about an eighth of an inch long, but when it has had a blood meal, it could be up to a half of an inch. Next slide, please. Okay, the American dog tick or the wood tick. This is probably one of the most common ones that you're going to find on yourself or on your pets. This one also transmits Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Tularemia and tick paralysis. Now tick paralysis is an interesting thing. Um, it actually, it, it's not um, caused by a pathogen, but actually a toxin that the, the tick injects into you. Um, I don't, this, don't think this is very common, but some people have a reaction. And it can actually cause loss of motor coordination and slurred speech. And as soon as you remove the tick, then those symptoms uh, go away. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, these are found in areas with little or no tree cover, so more grassy type areas. And they can lay uh, 4,000 to 6,500 eggs and then the female dies. The unfed larva can crawl in search of a host and can live 540 days without food. My goodness, that's more than a year. So um, they are pretty hardy creatures. Adults can live for up to two years without food. That is just really amazing. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to add. So they do feed on a variety of hosts, mice, anywhere from the size of mice up to deer. And uh, when they are engorged, they can be up to a half of an inch in size. And they do need to be attached to you more than 24 hours. Research seems to, to suggest before, um, you know, diseases would be transmitted. Okay, next slide, Ashley. So here we have the Lone Star Tick. And this tick, I think it, this shows the festoons really nicely. You can see those little um, plates at the lower margin of, the, of their body. But uh, you'll see the male has some of those white markings on the festoons that helps you to, to differentiate there. Okay, so this disease, or excuse me, this tick transmits the following diseases. Human ehrlichiosis, tularemia, southern tick associated rash illness, and meat allergy, which is kind of odd too. But it can actually, a bite from this can actually cause you to have an allergy to meat. Okay, it's found mostly in woodlands and dense undergrowth near and around animal nesting areas. The larvae feed on small animals. Uh, and the adults feed on larger animals. They have long, long mouth parts, just like the black leg deer tick. A female can lay over 8,000 eggs before she dies, so that's a lot of eggs. Okay, let's move on to the next one. So here's the one that most people are most fearful of, and that's the black leg tick, or uh, some people call it a deer tick, and that's because it transmits Lyme disease. And Lyme disease, while all of these other diseases can can be deadly, Lyme disease, um, you know, can cause a, a lot of problems for people, especially if it's not caught early. And there are 30,000 cases of Lyme disease on average per year. So, and there's a lot of this um, going around. So people are naturally very concerned. And uh, also because the 
the larvae are just so tiny and the nymphs are tiny too. It's, they're hard to find. So most of these are found in the in deciduous forests and uh, they rely on deer as adults for their last blood meal in order to get enough energy to then produce the eggs. So you're gonna find them where you find deer. And a female can lay about 3,000 eggs before she dies. Okay, it does take two years for this tick to complete its life cycle, and we will see a slide about that um, in a little bit. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say until the next slide. So I think, Ashley, I'm going to be handing it over to you. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention a couple good comments from the chat um, about like the meat allergy that's traditionally just to red meat, um, not so much like the white fish or chicken. Um, so that's that was a good point that Jennifer made in the chat. Um, and we had a question about how common is it that um, that they would actually lay eggs in your home, Sherry, do you have? I don't think it's super common is what I replied in the chat unless you had a very high infestation. You mean for all ticks or one species in particular? I think it didn't mention a species in particular. Yeah, I, I think, I know that uh, we had some relatives who had a problem with the tick infestation in their house. And at the time I didn't, you know, I didn't ask what kind or what it was. But my suspicion would be that it was either a brown dog tick or the American dog tick. I mean, it's also possible it could be a wood tick if they come in on your pets. But realize that in order for them to lay eggs, it means they've had to be attached to the host for many days. And that, you know, is different with different species. Um, I forget one of, which one, it's the, um, uh, we're going to talk about that when the Asian longhorn tick has to be attached for up to 14 days before it drops off and is ready to produce eggs. So we're talking, you know, seven days, five days or more that this tick has got to be attached to its host so that it can lay eggs. So usually with people, that's not going to happen, right? You're going to find the tick way before that. But with pets, um, they could have one of these ticks and bring it into the house. It could drop off after it's, you know, finish its blood meal and then, um, you know, release the eggs in your house. So it is possible. Now it's very unlikely it would be a deer tick, okay, because they're gonna, they usually are finishing their life cycle on deer. Um, okay, so that's, okay, that's my thought on that. Thank you. Okay, is everybody still hearing us? Somebody asked if we lost, they lost audio. I can still hear okay. Everyone else, I assume is okay. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna move on into uh, prevention. So obviously like with any, with anything, we want to prevent a problem before it occurs. Uh, that's always easier than a treatment. Uh, so we're gonna talk about some ways that uh, we can prevent these these ticks from getting on us. Uh, so the first way is to, of course, um, exclude them from your body. If you know you're going to be out in, again, tall grasses uh, and that sort of thing, um, anywhere where you're going to be where there's a lot of uh, warm-blooded hosts that you know live there. So if you know you're going into an area hiking where there's a lot of deer, you know, mice, squirrels, you know, all the kind of warm-blooded things that these ticks want to live on, uh, you want to be particularly careful for yourself. Uh, the first thing you can do is to wear long pants and long sleeves. Again, the more likely the tick, the longer it takes the tick to find, you know, skin on your body, the less likely it'll be to actually attach. So, you know, it's one thing if it just crawls on your pants and then it falls off. Um, so you, you have to be careful. So wear long pants, make sure that you tuck your pants into your socks, um, which would be of course in your shoes, uh, so that you can, um, you know, have a barrier there so that there's no little easy access to your skin. Because again, once they get on your skin, uh, that's when they're gonna be able to attach um, and get that hypostome, you know, embedded into your skin, which again, that doesn't happen momentarily. Uh, that can take a couple of hours uh, for them to actually, you know, embed themselves. Uh, so the sooner you can, um, 
get them off your body, the better off you're going to be. Uh, the next, the third thing that you can do is to you wear clothing that is treated with a repellent, a tick repellent, uh, primarily permethrin. That's the most common. Um, the most, yeah, the most common is to use a, a repellent that has permeth permethrin in it. Uh, now, always be sure that when you're using any of these types of repellents that you are following the label directions. Um, they're really, really important. So if you have a product that just goes on clothing, that does not mean that it goes on your skin. That also does not mean that you should be applying it to your clothes while you're wearing it. Um, a lot of these products are supposed to be dried on your clothes or on your shoes uh, before you actually insert your body into them. So that's how it's going to keep you safe. Um, you don't want to be putting these potential poisons onto your skin if they're not labeled for that use. Um, so repellents such as DEET, uh, they are for on clothing and open skin, uh, but do you just don't want to mix and match these. You want to make sure that you are following the label directions uh, correctly. Uh, you also want to make sure that you check yourself for ticks after being in the woods or in tall grass. Again, anywhere that you think would be good tick habitat, um, places that are not mowed um, and things like that are going to be a great habitat uh, for these critters. And of course, as soon as you get done uh, being outdoors, you want to take a shower as soon as possible, wash your clothing uh, as soon as possible so they're not just hanging around in the laundry basket. Uh, I've heard other people say where they actually um, put their clothes um, into the dryer first because the high heat will actually be sure to kill, you know, any type of, of critter that could be on there. So just a thought there. So the next type of uh, prevention is to prevent the habitat uh, that these ticks may be living in. So again, anytime you can keep the grass mowed, keep rakes leaf, uh, leaf, keep the leaves raked along a forest edge and that sort of thing, uh, that's going to help prevent the habitat for a lot of the mice and a lot of the warm-blooded animals uh, that are going to be the host for these ticks. Um, you know, a lot of times humans are not their preferred host, but again, they're opportunistic. Um, so you, so they're gonna they're gonna latch on to anything that that they see is moving or that's providing heat or that has the, the carbon dioxide emission. Um, you can do something called tick fogging, uh, which would be the environment around your home. Again, this is going to be very limited in how, how well it works, um, and it's only going to be temporary control. It's not something you're going to be able to do, uh, you know, all months out of the year. Another thing to do is uh, to exclude or remove deer from your property. Uh, particularly, this is going to help reduce the number of uh, deer ticks that you're seeing in the area. Uh, again, how how easy is this going to be? Uh, I listened to a, a webinar a couple months ago from um, the EPA that they did on ticks and they were actually um, baiting deer um, to have them come into bait stations and they were actually treating them um, to kill the ticks themselves. So treating them with you know products that would be kind of like similar to what you use like on a dog maybe. I'm not saying it's the same thing um, but but similar to that uh, they were using a product like that to kill the ticks that would maybe be on the deer. It's the same type of thing that they're doing. If you see these pictures on the right hand side of your screen, these are called tick tubes. So what they do is they put cotton balls or a similar product inside of this tube uh, and then the white footed mice are going to actually take these cotton balls that have a permethrin product on them taken back to their nest. So it's not killing the mice, but it's actually killing any ticks that could be on the mice. Uh, so that's kind of a, a neat way to, to, to think about doing something like that. Um, so you're, you're treating the, the critters that would be transmitting the ticks to your, to your home and to your habitat. Another thing to do is uh, check and brush pets and animals that have been in the woods and tall grass. Um, again, if you know, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to do, but if you do have inside pets, uh, that's probably something you want to do fairly regularly during uh, tick season. You can use tick control products such as collars or repellent baths. Again, you want to make sure that you're reading and following your instructions carefully. 
Um, you know, some products are just for cats. Some products are just for, um, you know, just for dogs or just for a specific species of, of animal. Um, so be sure that you're not mixing and matching or else you could have some, you know, some unintended effects uh, with, with, for, for try, with trying to prevent these ticks. You can also speak to your local veterinarian. There are some different vaccinations available uh, for some tick-borne diseases. Um, you know, pets that are showing signs and symptoms of any type of tick-borne disease, you want to make sure you get them uh, checked out. Uh, just, you know, something to, to consider. It's always a, a possibility, um, even if you haven't seen a tick on, on your particular animal. Um, and I know some of the products that, that go on, on pets, they may not prevent a tick from actually being on the pet, but they'll prevent it, they won't let it be on the the pet for very long. Uh, so sometimes that's how it works too. Uh, so one of the main questions we get is how to remove ticks safely. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of different, um, I'll say tales over the years of how the best way is to remove a tick. But by far, uh, the best way to do it is just to get fine tipped tweezers you want to grasp the tick, just like this picture shows, as close to the, the head, the hypostome as possible, and you want to pull steady but slow, okay? Um, a lot of people worry that if you pull the head off that that's going to cause trouble, but the most important thing is that the, what you want to get the tick off of your body or off of your pet's body as quickly as you can to prevent any type of, you know, disease transmission from occurring. Um, so again, you don't want to grab the tick in the middle of the body because that's going to just help to push more potential disease pathogen into your, into your, into the wound that's created. Um, so just, just be careful. Again, follow these instructions as you see this picture here. Find tipped tweezers. Uh, grab as close as possible to your skin. Even if you get a little bit of your skin, that might hurt a little, but that's better than, you know, not getting uh, the majority of the tick out. Once you remove the tick, um, it's a really good idea to put it in, uh, like, in two pieces of tape so the sticky sides are together with the tick in the middle. Uh, that way you can preserve it if you need to and put it in the freezer. I would recommend putting it in, like, either a container or a, a Ziploc bag, a freezer baggie or something like that, too. Um, just to keep them there. And then if you were interested in getting any type of, you know, testing done on the tick, sometimes some different laboratories will um, test for certain diseases uh, right in the tick itself. Um, that way you've, you've preserved the tick in case you want to do any follow-up um, type of research with it or, you know, any, find out any additional information, okay? Just a quick, you know, do not use Vaseline, soap, cotton balls, or touch it with a hot match. Okay, that's just going to make it angry. That's not going to really um, do any good. Um, you know, a lot of the theories were that it would smother it and it would have to pull its head out, um, but that really doesn't work. The best thing is to do is just to, to grab it and get it out of there. One of the neat things I saw at our health fair a couple years ago uh, that our health department was giving out was something called a tick card remover. Uh, so I put that picture here in the right hand side. It's about the size of a credit card um, and you know you could you just squeeze that opening here on the top um, onto the tick and then, and then you would use it to to pull it out if you didn't have a pair of of tweezers available. All right I'm going to turn it back over to Sherry for information on Lyme disease. Okay, so we're going to talk about Lyme disease. Uh, it's the number one vector-borne disease in the United States, and most of the cases are concentrated on the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast region, as well as the Great Lakes areas of the United States. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk about the life cycle of um, of the tick that carries the Lyme disease, which is the black leg tick. And the disease is actually caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. So when the black leg tick or deer tick hatches out of the egg in its larval form, it does not 
carry any disease. It's not until the first blood meal where it will get infected with this bacterium. So in general, uh, these, these larval tick are laid into leaf litter in the woods and they hatch out and then they attach to small rodents and birds. Now white-footed mice tend to be the, the primary culprit um, for producing the infected ticks. They are the primary reservoir for this disease. So once the larva feeds on the white-footed mouse, then it becomes, and that's during the, the spring, probably more like the summertime, the summertime. After that, then it kind of goes into an inactive period while it's transforming into the, its next stage, the nymph stage. And so it's overwintering that way, and then it becomes active again in the spring as a nymph, okay? And then the nymph is gonna need to go and find another blood meal so that it can then uh, move on to the next stage, which is the adult stage. So at this point, the nymph may feed on small mammals, it could feed on deer, larger uh, mammals, and people. So the pretty much the greatest uh, risk of a human infection for Lyme's disease occurs uh, in the late spring through summer, and that's when the, the nymph is active. Now, once that nymph gets its second blood meal, it is then uh, goes through another molt and goes into the last stage of development, which is that of the adult. Now, the adult will then look for a larger host, usually deer, and it will get its last blood meal on the deer, and then the female will overwinter, and then she will lay her eggs in the spring. So that's when the eggs are hatching out, is in the spring. Okay. So this, I had a question in the chat. It asked, you know, if other ticks carry this disease. And so far in the United States, no. It is only the black leg tick that carries the Lyme disease. And um, what else did I want to say? Oh, so the ticks have got to be attached for greater than 24 hours. Uh, that's what research is finding in order for Lyme's disease to be transmitted to the host. So if you find it within the first 24 to 36 hours, you have you've greatly reduced your risk of having the uh, tick transmit this bacterium to you. And the, the further along you go, the longer in time, the greater your risk is. So, you know, after three days, you know, your risk has really increased as far as whether or not uh, this bacteria will be transmitted to you. Now, not all black leg deer ticks carry the disease, but um, you don't know that, right? So you want to get it off as, as soon as possible. So as Ashley was um, suggesting, you know, make sure you check yourself every day for deer ticks. Okay, go ahead with the next slide, please, Ashley. Okay, so Lyme's disease, um, it's, it does not, um, after an initial infection, the bacterium does not like circulate through your body, through the blood. It kind of lodges in different tissues and in organs, but kind of in, in low numbers. And there were some questions in the chat about, you know, the, the bullseye marking. So that is an indication, you know, around the tick's bite site. If you see that the red rash that looks like rings, um, and there'll be like concentric rings getting larger as they go out, that is an indication of the, the uh, tick bite from the black-legged tick. And so you definitely need to get checked out, go to a doctor. Treatment for Lyme is, uh, or excuse me, is antibiotics. And um, there are 30,000 cases reported every year. So if you have any, you know, if you think you have been bit by a, a deer tick at all, you found one on you, you, de you probably definitely want to go and see your doctor about it. So it is treatable if caught early, but uh, if it's not caught early, uh, it can progress into um, have some very serious um, uh, side, you know, very serious effects on your body. So let's talk about some of the symptoms that you'll see with uh, the early onset of Lyme's. 
Um, many people, probably most people, indicate that they have fatigue, you have headache, could have that rash, that bullseye rash, fever, possibly chills and sweats, muscle ache, joint pain, neck pain, and to a lesser degree, you may have some sleep issues. So those are generally the things, kinds of symptoms that you will have. And those symptoms can uh, set in anywhere from a, a, a few days to up to uh, two weeks or maybe even longer uh, that you will see some of these uh, symptoms. So if you don't catch the Lyme disease early you and it goes undetected for a while, the disease may progress and you can actually, uh, you know, weeks or months later, even a year later, if it has gone undetected, some of the late symptoms you would see would be arthritis or joint pain, could be nervous system abnormalities such as numbness, pain, Bell's palsy, even meningitis, which is a swelling in your brain. Um, it could, it could uh, result in an irregular heart rhythm. So, and some people experience depression, okay, and have, you know, co other cognitive issues. So, it can be very serious. Okay, next slide. Okay, so for this portion, the very end here, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a new tick. Uh, this is a, an invasive exotic tick, which was originally found in New Jersey in 2017 in Hunterdon County on some livestock. Now this tick, as its name indicates, comes from Asia. And after some research now, they believe it has been here before 2017, but that's when it was officially uh, found. And this uh, species of tick also has est established populations in Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. Now, there's some really kind of unusual things about this tick, and that being that the females are parthenogenic. They don't need to have a male present in order to reproduce. So they can reproduce without fertilization. So that means that all of their offspring uh, are clones. They're genetically identical to the female. And it means that they can re reproduce very rapidly. So one female can lay up to 2,500 eggs. And this creates dense infestations on animals. In fact, so much so that it can actually kill the animals if they are so infested with all of these ticks at one time. They die from anemia. Now, they, they prefer to be on livestock, wildlife, or domestic pets. Not usually people, but they have been found on people, but to a much lesser degree. Um, so you'll notice in the, the second sentence here on the slide, it says they're invasive clonal populations. And that's because these females are making clones of themselves. So yes, these invasive populations that have traveled from Eastern Asia to Australia, New Zealand, and Asia, are all clonal populations, which is kind of interesting, but scary at the same time. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so they have a very uh, similar life cycle to the rest of the ticks that we've been talking about. It is a, um, let's see, they go from larva, and then they have to feed and then they molt and then they have a nymph and it has to feed and then it goes into the adult so it has to have you know the three hosts like the other ones and um, they do quest on grasses so they're, they're found mostly in, in grassy areas not wooded areas and they will attach for three to five days and uh, when they become adults they they actually need to attach to their hosts for seven to fourteen days okay now the um, the adult Ticks are similar in size to the other ticks. They're about an eighth of an inch in size, and that's before a blood meal. They do not transmit limes. Tests have been, and studies have been done. They're not capable of transmitting limes, but they, the tests have, all, have shown that they are capable of transmitting Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but we'll um, talk about that a little bit more. So the concerns with the, with the Asian longhorn tick are, there's three main concerns. And 
that is their ability to establish, establish populations in colder regions. And because of that, um, they can spread throughout the US. And also, you know, how much of a vector are they gonna be for disease transmission? Okay, next slide, please. So what is the current distribution of the American longhorn, or excuse me, Asian longhorn tick in the United States? Well, it is currently found as of a report from USDA APHIS uh, in December, and I don't think it's changed since, I think the report said the same in February. It is now found in 12 states, Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. Now in Maryland, the counties it has been found in are Allegheny, Washington, and Prince George's County. So they have found that the original tick population that was in New Jersey was able to survive the winters. And so now they have a, an established stable clonal population in New Jersey. And this tick has been found to be able to survive winters in Northeast Asia and as far north as Primorsky Krai, Russia, where the temperatures drop below 14 degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't know exactly how cold they can go, but they can um, probably survive temperatures down to, you know, definitely below 14 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe zero. Don't know exactly, but it's pretty cold. So that means it has the ability to spread north, okay? And definitely has the ability to spread south and west. Now, uh, the distribution of this tick now appears to be along the Appalachian mountain range, which is very interesting. Uh, they've collected ticks from all kinds of animals, uh, dogs and raccoons and skunks and livestock and people, but with more so on wildlife uh, than on livestock and people at this point. Okay, next slide. So because ticks are the most important vectors for infectious disease in the Northern Hemisphere, we are concerned about what role this new tick is gonna play in transmitting diseases to humans and to livestock. So in the, the country of origin in Asia, this tick has transmitted the, the following diseases, sheep and bovine theoliriosis, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, Japanese spotted fever, Powis and virus or disease, severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome, Huayangshan virus, and hemorrhag or hemorrhagic fever. So, so far, none of these ticks that have been collected here in the United States have been found to have any of these pathogens. So that's the good news. But we know it's only a matter of time from when one of these ticks, you know, takes a blood meal from an infected animal, wildlife or cattle, and then it can be transmitted. So we have to keep our eye on that and, and be concerned. So um, we already talked about the uh, Tick Encounter website a little bit. It is an excellent resource. <clears throat> so I would go there to, if you have a find a tick, you can go there for uh, information and they have those great uh, guides for ide identifying ticks. Also, they allow you to send in tick samples. It does cost $50 to have a tick um, analyzed to see if it, is, if it has any of these pathogens in it. And uh, there's instructions on the website on how to do that. But the first step is for you to send a picture to them and they will help identify it. And then if you want to test it to see if it has diseases, you can send that in to Tick Encounter. However, I did look on the, the website recently and it said that uh, with the coronavirus right now, the, the lab is not operating as far as, as doing those tests to see if the ticks contain pathogens, but they do have staff that can help you identify ticks if you, you know, send things in over the internet. So that's unfortunate and hopefully they will get that back up and running um, soon. 
but also another source for you, resource for you is to go to your local extension office and uh, there should be personnel in there who can help to identify ticks for you. Now they can't test them to see if they have diseases, but they can help identify ticks. And currently um, extension offices in Maryland are not open to the public, but we hope that that's gonna change soon. Ashley, did you wanna add anything else? Yeah, I just was going to reiterate that um, the identification of the tick through the tickencounter.org, that part is free completely. And, and they are very, very good, have a very quick turnaround time. So I've, I've used them and I've had clients through the extension service um, use them and uh, very good resources with identifying them. Yeah, and so, something else I'd like to add is um, if you're going to bring a tick in for identification, I think the best way to do that is to put it in a, uh, a Ziploc bag and put it in the freezer or put it in some isopropyl alcohol. I've had people bring it in uh, stuck to tape and I can't, it's really hard to, um, to see that through the tape for some of the finer detail. Um, and also if you try to get the tick off the tape, all the legs come off and everything. So I don't think that's the best way to do it. I think the other two ways would be more helpful to the person who is doing the identification. Yes, good point. Uh, so we had a question about um, what eats ticks. So somebody asked if it was true that um, possums eat ticks and I, Sherry, do you know the answer to that? I've seen a lot of stuff on social media that they do, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I've heard that. I mean, I'm not up on that. And I know uh, all I've read about chickens and guineas eating ticks as well. So I think that's probably true, but I, I don't, I'm not up on all those details. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I thought too. And good, good. Okay, if anybody has um, questions, I think feel free to enter them into the chat. Sherry, that was great information on uh, the Asian longhorn tick, another exotic invasive for us to, to look out for. Yeah, so I mean that one, um, probably people aren't gonna find those as much, but if you have livestock, you wanna monitor your livestock for this tick, for sure, and talk to your veterinarian about how you can treat your livestock and protect them from ticks. So we also, um, I put a few of the fact sheets um, from Purdue and also from uh, University of Florida links here in the other uh, resources page. So if you guys want just general information or something to share, a nice PDF uh, printout to share with friends or family, uh, you can visit those sites. Um, again, we will be uh, sending out the slides in the next few weeks or the next week, I'm sorry, as well as a link to our recording of this presentation. Uh, next uh, week is National Pollinator Week, and we are going to be doing a class on Friday, June 26th, called Attracting Pollinators to Your Garden. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please um, go ahead and pre-register. We'd love to have you um, attend that class. Sherry, do you have anything else you want to add? No, I think that's, I think that's it, and um, I don't see too many questions in the chat box, so. All right. Well, we thank you all again for, um, you know, joining us today and we hope that, you know, you, you learn something new and don't be, don't be afraid, don't be scared to go outside. I guess that's the bottom line I want to get across is that knowledge is power. So just um, use this knowledge of what to look for and, you know, if you're comfortable using a repellent of some sort, then um, please do that and um, get outside and enjoy nature. Yeah, I also had a thought of something. Um... I just remembered that uh, Master Gardener told me one time, she said, a, a great tip um, is for, you know, checking for ticks after you've been outside is to get one of those lint rollers. And this, so you can roll your body with that lint roller and, you know, it'll pick up the ticks on that. So I thought that's a pretty cool idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Anything to get it off there, get them, get them off. Yeah. Just <laughs> make sure you check yourselves. So, yep. all right, well, everyone have a great day and we will be sending out the, the slides here in the next few days. If you guys have any questions, I will um, go ahead and enter Sherry's email and mine in the, the chat box, um, just in case you guys need to reach out to us.
if not, I guess I hope you all have a great rest of the week. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks. Take care.